You know, there's an old adage, uh, I think, therefore I am. And um, that's no more true than it is in this book, You Are Not Your Brain, by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, who is my guest today to talk. How, can you really control what you do, what goes on in your life, by how you think, you are what you think? Oh, well, yeah, that, that, sure, that's true. I, I think a lot of people would sign off on that. I mean, that, that your patterns of thinking ha have a lot to do with, with, with how your life goes. Where in our current culture, things are sort of, there are two sides that are having a different perspective on things, is most people in the science, you know, in the sort of the, the biology, neuroscience side of things, would tend to want to say that the thoughts are coming from your brain per se, as though the brain is generating all aspects mm -hmm. of, of your mental experience. So everybody basically agrees, okay, you have thoughts, and it sure looks like what you're thinking is influencing what you're doing. But, but on what I think the, 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 I call them, and I think they'd be proud enough to call themselves the materialist side of, of the perspective, because um, that's a term that people who adhere to it are actually proud of. Um, on the materialist side of the perspective, they actually believe that all that thinking and all that experience is really just chemicals and electrical impulses in the brain sort of creating that. And that, and that the relationship between your thoughts and what you do can, can actually be ignored by just dropping out the thinking and saying, well, look, the brain's creating the thinking and the brain's creating what you're doing, so it's really all the brain. And, and, and that's the perspective that I think is incorrect. Incorrect. And I guess a lot of people would agree with you, right? It's the difference, difference between like a, a brain and a, uh, and a soul, I guess, in a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that's interesting, and again, maybe have a lot to do with all kinds of things that are ha have happened in this culture sort of in the last, in this generation and sort of at this particular juncture, which is there is, there is a very significant disconnect between what most people think about how, how the world works and what right and wrong is and how people should live and the way elites think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so there, there's more of a disconnect probably between the way elites think and the way regular people think now than there's mm -hmm. probably ever been in this country. So when we're talking about, uh, when you're writing about, uh, you're not your brain. Uh, let's, 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 give me an example. Let, let's say uh, somebody is uh, uh, an addict, for instance. And uh, so you can just, uh, you know, and I think science has, you know, come to prove to a, to, to a greater extent that a lot of addiction issues do lie in the brain and there's chemical reactions and there's That's all true. physical needs, right? But you feel that you can actually control that those reactions in the brain which cause the addiction. There you go. I mean, not easily. I don't think you can easily control them. Uh -huh. so, so I really do take a more, you know, a broader perspective on these things because, yeah, I mean, I've been a neuroscientist, you know, for going on 40 years, a long time. And, um, and so there's nothing that neuroscience says as science that I have any problems with at all. And you know, I've, I've been fortunate to make some contributions to, to, to the field. Um, so it's not that what I think the science as science says is wrong. So I don't think that it's incorrect to say, sure, there's mm -hmm. chemical stuff going on in the brain of a person who has addiction issues. No question. We're all completely in agreement on that, and we're all completely in agreement on the fact that at some level, those chemical imbalances in, in a person's brain need to be addressed for, for the person to really get to good health. Where we disagree is what, what's the best way to get those chemicals to get in the right balance. And if you believe that the chemicals are really the bottom line, then you're going to have a natural propensity, sort of it's logical to say, well, it's about chemicals, so we better treat it with chemicals. And, 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 and that largely has become the perspective of, of the National Institute of Mental Health, which is in, in all mental health issues, including addiction, you know, the, chem the problem is chemical, we better treat it chemically. 
Right. Now, the reason why I say you are not your brain is not in any way because I deny that the brain is very, very important. There's, there's a lot of easily understandable, worked very hard to make some stuff that's not n naturally easy to understand, very understandable in the book. There's a lot about how the brain works in the book, especially in the first part of it, that sets the basis for understanding what you can do with your mind, by which I really mean your attention to change those chemicals in your brain. So that's where, that's where we have a difference in perspective. Um, I really believe that choice is real. You're free to make choices about how you focus your attention. And those choices that you make about how to focus your attention really, really do affect how the chemicals in your brain work. So there's a whole added level there. We all agree that chemicals in the brain are very important. Where we have a difference in perspective in is what can affect the chemicals in, those brain, in the brain. And I believe that non-material mental force or mental activity, um, especially as manifested in how you choose to focus your attention, has major effects on how the chemicals in your brain work. That's, it, so, so that's it, the core right. of the... So in other words, you can just reframe how you're that's viewing or perceiving use. something, that's the word we use. and therefore that would affect the chemicals in your brain causing a, and a, a subsequent right reaction. And let's get right back. Let's talk about the addiction because I think the addiction yeah. question is very, very important and and is, is really a very good example to discuss because 12-step programs. I'm very supportive of 12-step programs. Among elite scientists, it's been a struggle. They're sort of very slowly coming around to accepting how important 12-step programs are in, in addiction. Why this difference? Why am I very supportive? You know, the elite's skeptical. It's because if, if your philosophical perspective is the one I have, which is how you frame your attention, how you understand the way you feel, the perspective that you put it in, um, if you're taking that as extremely important in how the brain works, then a 12-step program where a person has to go and have community, have an acknowledgement that my identity as a person with these kinds of problems, you know, I'm an alcoholic, is a very, very important, you know, once you can make that acknowledgement and once you can, you know, accept that this is going on with you, that acceptance and, and, and how that acceptance influences your sense of identity and, and creates in you an, an acknowledgement that you need community, that you need a higher power, that you need help, that yes comes from within, but comes as an interactive, very important sort of triangle between your, yourself, your community, and your higher power. And, and all of these things work together to make absolutely real changes in how your brain works. If you have a philosophy, which is very much what all my work has done and very much the philosophy in you and you are not your brain is, which is these kinds of issues, relations with community, how you understand your inner life, being able to accept the need for a higher power in your life, that these things have big effects in how your brain works, it's easy to say, sure, a 12-step program is very important in treating addiction. But if you're very skeptical about everything except the chemicals, you're going to go, well, why waste time with that? Let's just use chemicals. Right. And I think the culture has run into a lot of awareness that that, that, that limited view, or what sometimes gets called the reductionist mm -hmm. view, doesn't really work. And yet, the culture, the elite, ha the elite culture has invested huge resources in that being the way to go, unsuccessfully, I think. You know, undoubtedly, uh, the brain causes physical ramifications. I mean, people get anxiety attacks, they get panic attacks. And mental ramifications, mental, too, right. both, I mental mean, and you, physical. You can measure uh, brain um, um, waves, you can measure uh, heart rate, you can measure respiration, you can measure sweating. And now we can measure activity, that, that, that activity in right. the brain. I mean, all the brain imaging, mm -hmm. you know, which has become so popular, it's powerful. So how do you reframe it? Um, you talk about uh, essentially four steps yes. to reframe. Hypothetically, let's say uh, that somebody is anxious 
about something. And that anxiousness causes uh, panic attacks. Let's, uh, Very good let's example. Say, let's say uh, giving a speech. People yep. are, are afraid to get up and, and they're anticipating giving a speech in front of a group of people. They're getting anxiety attacks. It's going to cause a panic attack. I mean, their blood pressure is going to go up. They may, they may have uh, throw up. I mean, yep. they could have a lot of physical symptoms. How do you reframe? Okay, so reframe is the second step, so, th so okay. the first step is really helpful to get to the reframe, which is relabel, and, and, and relabeling is, is something I've been using in people who have obsessive compulsive disorder for a long, long time, um, and actually even just in the last couple of years there's been a whole lot of very well done research um, showing that just putting a label on how you feel really helps to calm down the emotional parts of the brain. So it's a very powerful thing. I personally got it from meditation tradition, this whole issue of labeling. So I didn't make it up by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, so how would I relabel stuff? What would step one be for me or somebody who uh, gets anxiety attacks or speaking in public? Here we go. First thing to do, there's, there's sort of a natural propensity for you to try to say, well, if I admit I'm scared, it's going to make things worse. It actually makes things better. You see, so, so it turns out that, that just putting an accurate label on what's going on, it's slightly counterintuitive. Right. People tend to think, if I tell myself I'm nervous, it's going to make me more nervous. It turns out it makes you less nervous. <laughs> it turns out there's a lot of energy that you're spending mentally and physically to try to convince yourself you're not nervous. Right, just when you really are. Just, exactly. Right. So it turns out that labeling things accurately helps to get, and especially when there are subsequent steps that help you then to deal with the fact. So you're not just left out there hanging. But the research that's been done, that's actually been shown, there's been a lot of research that shows that if people just say, I'm nervous about this, but I need to do it. It makes, they get less nervous. Right. <laughs> so, so, so relabeling is, is, is largely putting an accurate label on what's going on. Now, we really want to do that with what we call a mindful perspective, an impartial perspective, but the real term that we use is the wise advocate. And the wise advocate is very related to the higher power in the 12-step program. They're, they're very, very related. And, and the, you call on your inner wise advocate, which we all have, to then label and say, okay, I'm not alone, I am nervous. Once you do that, then you can get into the reframing step. Now, the reframing step has two main parts. The first part of it gets into this whole issue of it, realizing this is my brain playing tricks with me. Because a lot, a lot of times what's going on is based on habit patterns that we've gotten into in the past, your brain literally is playing games with you. Your brain, you're getting thoughts, you're getting feelings that are not necessary, that are not really related to what's actually going on. So the first part of reframing is actually realizing a lot of the way I feel and a lot of how worried I am about this are false brain messages and what we like to call deceptive brain messages. So you, this accomplishes two things. Number one, it sets you up to realize this is all false. And then we have a whole, the other part of reframing is cognitive restructuring that allows you to replace false beliefs with true beliefs. And that's very important. OK, can you give me an example of, uh, an, an example we're using, the, the fear of speaking in public, OK? What would, what would I consider to be the false messages that I'm getting and how would I, and what, how would I reframe getting. them? Okay, and this, the false messages that you're getting almost always have to do with, I'm going to flub up, I'm going to make a fool of myself, I'm going to be a laughing stock. That's right. a huge one. So, <laughs> people are going to laugh at me. That, people are going to not, you know, people are going to, I'm going to embarrass myself. Shame. Right. I mean, all of these kinds of things. This is your brain just bang, bang, bang. Okay. And so the, when you just start to say, wait a second, this is my brain sending me a false message. Yes, it sets you up so that you can correct the cognitive errors. You're not going to make a fool of yourself. You've practiced. You're ready. You're prepared. You know you've worked on this. You're ready to go. You're going to do fine. You know, positive affirmations, all these things, great. But, but even, in, you know, something that's as big or bigger than that, that comes from relabeling is being able to realize, hey, this isn't about me. <laughs> Don't be so worried. I mean, it's not like, it's not like my whole self-identity is wrapped up in this. 
It's okay. You know, it's something that's happening. You'll get through it. It's going to be okay. And when you relabel, this is a, the big, a big part of it. It allows you to pull back from that self-centered narrative and say, wait a second. I can now see things from my wise advocate's perspective. I can realize this isn't as important as you're making it. This is not the end of the world. My whole self-identity is not tied up in this. You know, there is a higher power. There is my wise advocate. There is, you know, there's God. There's, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, you, you, the strength of your faith helps huge amounts because the stronger your faith is, the more you can realize, hey, you know what? A lot of this is just not about me at all. Just let it happen. Let it happen. Be a conduit. Be a conduit for a power that's greater than yourself. Allow yourself to be guided by something bigger than yourself. So these are all ways of reframing that you can see they run the gamut from very sort of on the ground, common sense, correct distortions, up through you know, not being too attached to your self-concept, and up to you know, pretty, pretty developed spiritual mm -hmm. awarenesses of it's not about me. Allow yourself to be guided. You know, it's going to be OK. All of that. So that, right. so you can see reframing, and a lot of that is covered in, in, in the book, this whole issue of wise advocate, mindful awareness, which is that perspective beyond your narrow, self-centered perspective. Mm -hmm. That course, leads to refocusing, which is what actually changes your brain, yeah, and Focus, I, I, refocusing and your and attention. That's, that's your third step, right? And that's but, the third step. But I would think also that, that time plays an element in this also. I and mean, I would, t would tell my kids, you know, if they're upset about something at night, hey, go to sleep, tomorrow you'll, you'll feel better is. in the morning. Yep. Course, it's kind of an automatic uh, cleansing. Absolutely, some, and, some and th that accomplishes a lot of things right there. It, sound, it is simple, and yet it shows a person, hey, you know, tomorrow's another day. I don't have to deal with this all right now. Um, it's not as, like, catastrophically oppressive as it feels this second. Y you know, give it some time, give it some distance, get some perspective. You know, all very, you know, and all as simple as saying, get some sleep, deal with it tomorrow. Okay. So now we're up to the third step. Okay, so the third step is really just integrating what you've learned in the first two steps and then focusing your attention differently based on what you've learned. And the third step, refocus, is largely based on keeping in mind what you're really trying to accomplish, where you're really trying to go. I mean, and, 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 and the good purposes that you're trying to accomplish with, with your life. So refocus is really about keep your larger goal in mind. Keep your larger perspective. Be aware of it. And, and when, you're, when you're focusing your attention in ways that bring your day-to-day -day actions in alignment with your longer-term goals, this rewires your brain, because that's one of the big things. I suppose that's the big thing that I discovered in my scientific work, is that people, as they focus their attention, and, and we did this research using brain imaging in people with obsessive compulsive disorder. So even people who have these intrusive thoughts of, I have to check, I have to check, I have to check, and they check their door again and again and again and again, or you know, they, you know, they clean the same spot mm -hmm. over and over and over again, they know it doesn't make sense. They literally have a brain imbalance that's causing them to feel that way. This has all been studied for a long time now. And, and, and back in the 80s and the 90s, we showed that by just getting people to realize it's my brain sending me my fa a false message and refocusing my attention differently based on that knowledge, you literally can change the brain circuitry even in a, in a true neuropsychiatric condition like obsessive compulsive disorder. So we're just trying to apply that same principle to much, much, much lo lower intensity brain issues. And, and so as you focus your attention, your brain chemistry follows that. That's the big message. Mm -hmm. So it, you keep your big perspective in, in mind. You follow that. You, you understand what you're doing now as part of a bigger picture. You focus your attention accordingly. And then your brain starts to work with you instead of against you. A lot of the, 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 the bad things that you've learned that you didn't, weren't even aware of in the past that have wired your brain in ways to feel insecure, nervous, um, you know, ashamed, you change that. You literally change the brain wiring that underlies those thoughts and feelings. So that's why the refocus step is so important, because it's literally changing that circuitry. 
And, and can you break down the refocusing step in, in our example, uh, afraid to, uh, to, to publicly speak? Um, what would be some uh, uh, guidelines? I mean, I mean, how, how would you refocus in, in, in an issue like that? What would be the, the, the bigger picture, the greater good that you're talking about? Okay, so before we just started um, air, uh, taping, the, the, we were talking about simple relaxation meditation techniques. They're right. extremely, they're easy to learn. They're, they're reviewed in this book. They've been shown to help high blood pressure. They've been you know, shown to help all kinds of things. They're very easy to learn. All it amounts to is learning how to do um, in and out breathing with awareness, um, or even in and out breathing um, with, with uh, something that's reassuring to yourself associated. Mm -hmm. So you breathe in, you, you, you say, um, you know, I feel relaxed. You breathe in, out, you think of a relaxing scene. You know, or it could be, um, you know, Jesus is with me. Or it could be, um, the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or, you know, or it's whatever your belief system is. You, you, uh, you can align a, 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 a relaxing sentence and align it with your breathing. Mm -hmm. You do that for just a few minutes. It, it is, not only does it calm you down, it, all these physiological um, variables that have been heightened. We were talking before, you know, excessive cortisol secretion, you know, too much uh, adrenaline, muscle tension, um, all these things, they've been shown again and again and again. Blood pressure too high, sweating, all gets quieted down just by something as simple as that. And of course, you practice it every day, you learn how to do it. It's available. So that's just something that's extremely simple to explain. And then you start to, to sort of re reframe into refocus all of your anxieties around this awareness of, I can handle this. I can control this. This is a false brain message. There are, there's lots of things I can do about this. And then think of them about the positive. Review, you know, if it's public speaking, you know what you want to say, you know, have, you know, Positive affirmations, very important. I know my message. I'm just going to go out there and deliver it. I'm, uh, you know, I'm prepared for this. You know, I'm ready. Not letting the positive get wiped out by the negative fears. That's a lot of what this is about. It, it, a lot, it, it seems to me a lot of this is just advice that's been around for hundreds uh, of, of years. Thousands I mean, of years. Yeah, just just <laughs> yes. breathe. Just breathe. But the breathing part allows you to kind of freeze frame what's going on and go back to steps one and two that you're talking about and re, uh, refocusing and reframing and getting rid of the, the embarrassment and putting things in a perspective and yep. it kind of just quiets the your only body thing that's to do new that. here yeah. the only thing that's new here and again in our culture it's important I guess it's important even in some broader sense the thing that's new here is this mind-body integration that that we now understand you know we now know so much more about the fine points of the physical aspects of these m sensations now we know that these very old traditionally based approaches to mental well-being have very positive effects on those physical variables so even even down to to a changing your brain uh -huh. even down to changing your brain see that was the power of your words just knock down <laughs> a sign on our wall oh, here. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and um and then okay this F brings well, us there's, you know well okay i'm 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 willing to interpret it that way <laughs> <laughs> but okay so your fourth step is revalue clearly see the thoughts the urges the impulses for what they are there are sensations that are caused by deceptive brain messages. You know, and this all sounds, Dr. Schwartz, really easy to do on paper, but it's so difficult to control your mind. No, no, well, okay. To take control back so, of the mind. Okay, I, this one I'm really, really ready for. Because, yeah. I mean, going back a long time ago, I mean, you know, into the 80s, when I, you know, my first book, um, which was published in, in, in uh, the mid-90s and had 10 years of work behind that, um, was called Brain Lock. And it, as I mentioned, it was a book to help people with obsessive compulsive disorder. It's now in its 54th printing. It's been around for quite mm -hmm. a while now. And, and back then, f over 15 years ago now, when that book came out, and after having spent 10 years of work to write that book, 
People used to say to me, you make it sound so easy. Just have people do these steps, and then all of these terrible compulsive problems are just going to go away. I never said that. I mean, and, and, and it's absolutely not so easy. I mean, that's why there are four steps, and, and that's why there's a whole lot in there about connecting to a community, needing your wise advocate, needing a higher power, mm -hmm. needing to have faith. I mean, so this, it gets embedded in, in, in a deep and, and, and complex cultural context, and the need for support is very real. I mean, it's not like you just go out there, say some magical incantation, and it disappears, because that's exactly a setup for, 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 for not doing well. It's when people say, hey, you know what, I relabeled it and it still bothers me. Well, I'm sure used to that one because, you know, I, we've heard that again and again and again and again. I relabeled it and it still bothers me. Because the relabeling isn't going to make it disappear. But what the relabeling does is, is set a different context. So it takes work, it takes practice, but, but, but it's very effective when done regularly. And, 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 and the brain changes that occur it doesn't take years, but it does take weeks, weeks into months to, you know, get really full, you know, where you can take brain imaging pictures and see the difference. That took two to three months. But if you, if you have a sensitive awareness, and awareness gets more sensitive as we practice, you can see small differences. And, and one of my definitions of a powerful mind is seeing small differences and knowing what the implications of them are. Mm -hmm. So. We're not looking for from you know, a lot to a little very fast. We're, we're, we're just looking for gradual change, but with awareness. Gradual change right. with awareness. Well, and, and the, look, it's very encouraging that you can control some of these things. The name of the book is You Are Not Your Brain, a four-step solution. I'm Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, who is a psychiatrist over at uh, UCLA. UCLA, yes, right? psychiatrist I guess at I UCLA. forgot to say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. University of California, Los Angeles, okay. where I've been for over 25 years. Right, so you can pick this up uh, online or at whatever bookstores are left. <laughs> yes, whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. a sad statement Remember, too, you're but... not your brain, you're just thinking you are. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you. See you next week. Be sure to visit us online for more information about today's guests, to see past shows, or even contact us about being on the show. Simply go to theedbernsteinshow.com. That's the EdBernsteinShow.com.